Hello and welcome everybody. So this is the show where we bring together HR experts to break down some of the most fundamental topics in HR. We have four amazing guests with us today to talk about HR software, which is such a huge topic. I'm excited to jump into it. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists now. We've got Sid Cote, who is a global VP of HR. We've got Christine Stolpe, who is a payroll consultant at Wages Creek. We've got Lotus Buckner with us too, VP of People and Culture at Chowbus. And we have Sean Nickens, who is an associate banker at JP Morgan. So great group, great topic. I assume you guys love HR software, else you wouldn't be here. So I think we'll have fun together and address a lot of common questions. I want to start by just kind of setting the scene because uh, HR software is such a broad term. Um, and I just want to give people an idea of sort of what's out there, what are different software solutions that are uh, common or popular. Uh, and I want to turn it over to you first, Christine, if you wouldn't mind. Tell us a little bit about some of the kinds of HR software that HR professionals can be thinking about, looking into. I know there's a lot of acronyms that maybe we'll have to explain, but um, let's, let's give this one over to you first. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate going first. Um, HR software is so, like you said, vague and, and all encompassing. Um, you have to think about, you know, we have the ATS, which will be our first little initial thing to go over, and that's your applicant tracking system, right? So first and foremost on the front lines, when people are applying for the jobs, are you tracking that? Are you tracking them for EEO purposes? Are you tracking them for um, you know, what kind of resumes are we getting? What class of resumes are we getting? Um, you know, when we put out an ad for this kind of thing, what kind of responses do we get? Those are the kinds of analytics that you can get out of an application applicant tracking system. Um, and then you've got your full HRIS or human resources information system. And that's got all of your employee information from maybe even from the applicant tracking it's part of it all the way through to getting paid right a lot of hr systems don't include the payroll part of things and so you've got a different system that's considered the payroll system but it's still an hr system because it's hr information going into the payroll system and then maybe the payroll system then generates something else for the accounting software system so the HR system is, is like the brain of all things related to the employees. So it's it's not just software. It really is like a, a core brain function of your company. Yeah. Well, lots of great call outs there. We got payroll, HRS, ATS. Um, what else is on the table here? Let's let's open this up to to the whole group. Let's keep the brainstorm going. What are other functions in HR that can be supported by software? Uh, there's benefits, of course. Um, so there's benefits. There's performance management. There's onboarding as well. Those are three that come to mind. Love it. Compensation, leveling. Absolutely. Compensation. There's even leaves. Uh, some HRIS systems actually have a place where you can track leaves or FMLA as well as personal leaves. Yeah. Um, time tracking. I know, again, feeds into payroll. Yep. Um, man, what can we not? But that also would feed into workers' compensation or any kind of ACA reporting. Yeah. Um, One of the most popular that's out there is called uh, SAP. And it has everything under one umbrella, everything from HR to finance to economics, everything you will want just yeah. right there on, on the one umbrella yeah i think i think we'll talk more about specific vendors um as we go here but I, yeah sap huge in this space obviously uh that br bring it all together um what about survey software i mean like i feel like there's a lot of culture software out there right now um lotus i know you have the word culture in your job title um are, are there softwares out there that you see supporting that kind of function? 
Absolutely. Well, I really don't think that there's an area in HR that cannot be supported by uh, software or technology. And so I would say regardless of what space that you're playing in, in HR, there probably is software or technology to support you. Uh, but I see kind of engagement surveys falling under what I would call like talent management, which includes some things that have already been said, like performance management, um, the engagement surveys. There's also KPI tracking that happens. That's really big in the startup space. Um, career pathing is uh, under that umbrella. The LMS can often fall under there. So you you know a lot of companies have a learning management system. That's what that stands for. Um, Sometimes that is available through your same HRIS vendor if you go with one of the big players in the field. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a standalone um, and you might, you know, get something that is separate from your HRIS, like a Taleo or an EdApp. Um, so it can go either way. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we painted a good picture here. People have a lot of different acronyms floating around, a lot of different... There's there's a million and one different vendors who want to take your money and provide some sort of, right? Um, and uh, hopefully in a beneficial way. But let's start to narrow it down, right? And talk about specific businesses and maybe what a software package might look like in their use case. And I want to start with the smallest companies around. So let's say less than 50 employees, um, you know, maybe they have an HR person at this point. Maybe they're not quite there yet. Hopefully they have an HR person. Uh, what kind of software would you recommend for a business of that size? Um, and Christine, I, I see you unmuting yourself. So let's start with you and then maybe we can jump over to Sid as well. Um, well, I'm on the West Coast. And so I will preface the beginning of this part of the conversation with when you get to... Uh, software that supports that size of employer, it can become a bit of a regional game. Um, on the West Coast, there is a new player on, and it's California only right now, but they're called Hourly. And it's a really great system for a small business owner who's either doing payroll themselves or has, like you said, one person in charge of all of payroll, all of benefits, all of human resources. Um, and they even offer workers' compensation audit support. So um, it's really great on the West Coast. Gusto is another uh, up-and-coming group. Um, they're based out of the Bay Area as well. Um, they started as Zen Payroll and then realized that their name was too close to Zenefits, which is a completely different company. So they changed their name to Gusto Payroll. Um, and they're doing really well. They've got a fantastic platform and they're growing um, so I have nothing but good things to say about them. Um, so it, it really just depends on what kind of support a small employer wants. Do they want handholding or do they want to go with a Paychex or a Paylocity or an ADP or a UKG, right? Who will take on an employer of, of a small size. You yeah. just, the support and, and the relationship that you have with that vendor is going to be a lot different. Yeah. Well, and just in some of the names you mentioned too, Sounds like a lot of payroll. Sounds like everyone wants to get payroll off their back and make paying their employee. I mean, I guess that's just a base. That's like the one function you absolutely need to get right. It's paying your employees. So I guess it makes sense for a small business. Um, Sid, let's go over to you though. What? Let's build on this. What? What softwares? Um, you know, vendors or just categories of software do you, mm -hmm. do you see a small business really needing? Well, I also think in today's age, we also have to keep in mind that not everybody is located in the same place. So um, even though you might have a company that's small, 50 employees or 25 or less, are they all in the same place? So something to think about when you're looking at HRIS systems is, does it support multi-state? So some of the ones that um, I think support small employers are, uh, namely, I think Christine said Paylocity, which is great. There's Paycom and there's Paycor. And those are all really specialized in about a thousand or less employees. So they really focus on the small, maybe even startup in the small uh, companies. So that's really helpful. And a lot of these come full blown. So when you think of the large ones like 
ADP or SAP or Successories or, um, gosh, what's another one? Kronos or Ulti Pro. They're huge. They come with everything. But some of these smaller ones, they come with a lot of things too. So like Paycor and Paycom, they come with integrated payroll, integrated uh, time cards, which is great. Um, they also come with, you know, some uh, sort of an LMS, for example, benefits, talent management. So it all depends on how quickly your company is growing. But I would uh, tell people, especially a one person HR department, which I have been myself, you know, what are the needs of the company? And can the software sustain the growth that your executive team wants to have happen? Yeah. Great insights there. Um, Lotus, I want to I want to bring you in here and talk more about these companies that are growing fast and are really big, um, you know, we talked about, you know, pay being the core of maybe some of these smaller companies, but how do software needs maybe change when you're getting to the enterprise level or a thousand plus employees, even what are your kind of thoughts in the software you might need? I think that you have to think present state and future state a little bit. Um, and, to Sid's point, you have to really, it differs for every single company, depending on your size, depending on your industry, depending if you're highly regulated or not, um, you're going to want to implement certain things first. And then make sure that whatever you're implementing and what your company goals are, if your company's goal is to grow, then you have to consider that when you're purchasing software, right? Yeah. Whereas if you're just planning your company's business goals are really to stabilize and get to profitability, then you might be able to just kind of stick with a smaller vendor and be sustainable for quite a while with that. So I think those are the types of questions you're going to want to ask yourself as you um, continue to grow as a company, because it's not necessarily that a smaller um, company to Sid's point can't support bigger size um, employee populations because they can't, they can actually support quite a bit. So if you're growing from like, 50 to 100, they can probably even take you to 1,000. Um, but if you're going, right, like 20,000 employees, you might be looking at an Oracle, you might be looking at an SAP, success factors. Um, so I think it's just important to ask yourself all of those questions and do a really deep business uh, analysis before you just go off and purchase software. Because I think that happens a lot as it's a shiny new toy. Technology is always a shiny new toy. And people just want to get it because especially if you're a team of one, you want to get that. Um, it just seems like an easy solution, right? To get some help and without resources. But sometimes that can be a bad decision and a very costly one if you don't think about the business needs. Yeah. And and I, I think I want to keep going down that direction, um, evaluating the needs and really figuring out, you know, what are some of the criteria we look at to figure out if you're ready for a certain software or not. Um, but Sean, I want, I want to take it over to you next and continue with, sort of the company size question and where different softwares plug in. Cause I know that you're at wow. JP Morgan, which is a huge company. Um, what kind of softwares are you interacting with um, that you think are beneficial at a company of your size? Well, JPC Morgan Chase Bank, they use, I believe PeopleSoft. Mm -hmm. So they're able to uh, maintain just the, um, uh, just the just the payroll and just the um, the human resources uh, side of the business. But as far as the uh, topic, uh, a lot of people are also turning back to uh, QuickBooks online. You know, they some mm -hmm. companies like the uh, the cloud packages. You know, but it's mainly for the startup companies. You know, like Lotus was saying, the companies that don't have to do too much. I mean, if they just want to be able to keep their books accurate and just be able to, you know, count their beans, let's just call it, you know, yeah. then, then they, they just have a function for all of that and they might just outsource human resources and payroll. But now, you know, some companies, they're beginning to, to shift a little bit and say, well, as my business grow, my software package needs to grow because now I'm getting more employees. Now I'm having more responsibility yeah. now i have to incorporate other things and and i might just want to use one person for that i don't want to have 
an accounting manager, an HR manager, and and five employees and that sort of thing. So yeah. it's it's just important that you get the type of software that fits your business. It's just important. Yeah. Um, quickly off of your comment around QuickBooks, I think that's a super interesting one. Like QuickBooks and another tool that we don't often think of as software, uh, Google Sheets and Google Drive, right? <laughs> um, we actually, so I, outside of my work with HR Mavericks and this community, I do work for Eddie, which is an HR tech company. And we primarily serve less than 50 employee companies. And that's our number one competitor is, um, right, is people are in spreadsheets or in Google Docs or whatever. And uh, it's hard to beat free, right? Um, right, it's, right. it's another great. one called awesome. FreshBooks or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah, and QuickBooks for, for payroll and all that. Um, we started to move in the direction of, okay, so like we're identifying some different company sizes, maybe assigning us to different software needs, mentioning some vendors. And there's so many vendors out there you guys have already mentioned that are great. Um, let's talk about how though someone could look at their own, own organization and say, what software do I need? Um, Sid, I want to maybe have you start us off on this conversation and then Christine as well. But how would you think about that? If you're, let's say you just got dropped into organization fresh on the job, how do you figure out what your software needs are? I guess the question I would ask myself first is what can I automate and what can I get off my plate that the software could support? Um, so that would be my number one question, not necessarily what software, but what can I automate and what software would support that? That would be uh, where I would be headed with that. So I think um, as a one man show, there's a lot of low hanging fruit that we don't think about. And I think sometimes we uh, are a little shy in automating because for whatever reason we may think, oh, um, you know, it's gonna take over my position or something like that. But when you're a one man show, you can't think that way. You really have to think about what can I get off my plate? What can I automate? Why would I automate it? And does the software support this automation? So I'll use benefits as a great example. Benefits, yes, it only happens usually once a year or special enrollments, but there's a lot of intricacies, right? And if you're a one-man show, you may or may not have the time to go and enter all of this manual items into vision or life insurance or, you know, uh, health and wellness. So it's great if you could have an EDI feed uh, in your software. So I would start asking like, hey, does the software support that? Does the software support maybe even a 360, meaning does it not only support an export, but does it support an import? If you have a 401k, people make changes on your 401k. You have to go in and uh, look in your 401k vendor to see what happens so you can add that to the payroll. Be great if that could just come back. So what can you automate and does the software support that? Yeah, great principle to stand by there. Um, Christine, anything you'd want to add there? Culture, culture, culture. We, we, we talk a lot about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the workplace, but we don't think outside our own walls. And I think it's super, super important that whatever culture you're building inside your organization, you have to partner with vendors that share your similar values. Mm. So make sure that you're asking questions about culture. Make sure that you're asking questions that give you a feel for when you're stuck and it's Tuesday and it's 1045 and you have to hit the submit button by 11 o'clock or it's Thursday evening and you have a massive list of comp changes coming in or you're in the middle of open enrollment and all of a sudden, you know, some T1, T2, T3 flag isn't set the way it's supposed to. And it's nothing that you can do autonom autonomously at your location. You have to get in touch with someone, you know, at your vendor. So knowing what kind of response you're going to get, knowing before you even make the phone call is 110% of your 
mindset, your employee's mindset, right? When I pick up that phone and I call to talk to somebody in the HR, you know, software service of Bamboo HR, am I going to get someone on the other end of the line who's going to put me on hold for 10 minutes while they go ask somebody how to do it? Or do they know how to do this? Or are they going to say, you know what, I'm not sure, let's figure it out together. So learning what kind of people you're going to be working with and, yeah. and what the the vendor that you're partnering with stands for is also really, really important because it has to mes mesh with your culture or the vendor is going to become an instant enemy. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great point. Yeah. Could I just add that I totally echo what Christine is saying and I would also tell people to add that to their RFP, um, their request for proposal. And that is something that um, I certainly do as well. You want to know what is the team or whom is on the team that you're supporting and what hours are they going to support you? Because if you're on the West Coast and they're on the East Coast, are they going to be open um, until 7 when it's your 5 o'clock? So it's good to know those um, those things as well and get introduced to who potentially would be the team if they were awarded the contract. I think it's also important. We don't always think about this and I see so many companies trip up when you don't involve the right stakeholders and relationships <laughs> are so important, right? And so when, I, when you're looking for software, it's also really important to get key stakeholders and two key ones that come to mind are finance and IT, right? So when I'm looking for software, on the, or technology on the HR side, I'm always thinking about the financial analyst, uh, analysis behind that, right? Like, did I do that upfront so I don't have to deal with a pissed off CFO, right? Like, yeah. I try to do that work upfront to say, you know, this is what it would cost me either to have X number of resources doing this versus technology, or sometimes the ROI or the cost analysis there is about a compliance, right? Like here's the risk mitigation that this mm. software or this technology is going to provide. Mm. And then from the IT side, right? Keeping in mind what kind of bandwidth does your technical team have, right? When I was working for big corporate organizations, when we would implement HR software, I got to lead teams of like, 50 people that just left their jobs in IT and finance and joined my team, right? Mm -hmm. For like three years while we implemented software, but being at a startup in a small company, my IT team is incredibly stretched. So I wanna be looking for software that is going to be 10 times easier to implement, um, yeah. where yeah. the vendor does a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah. Lots of great thoughts here. Um, Sean, anything you wanna add on scoping out an HR software and trying to figure out if it's a, if it's a good fit for your company. Well, only thing I could say is I agree with, uh, see it. Uh, the faster you do things, the, the more your bosses will be happy with you and, and the more you feel validated as an employee. So yeah, if you got some software and you said, okay, I want to, I want to automate payroll. We're getting a lot of new employees. We got to update them in the system. We got to calculate the the, um, the numbers and that sort of thing. And if you, you know, it really depends on how many employees you got. So, so when I was talking about QuickBooks and it's only fifty employees, it, it's okay because you can do an Excel spreadsheet for fifty employees. But when we're talking, you know, five hundred and a thousand employees, it, it just helps for you to take that into consideration because payroll is such an important part of, of HR, you know, you need to get that done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So yeah. I would just say that, uh, you know, and that's mainly um, what people are trying to stay ahead of now is just, just automating payroll, just making sure everybody get paid on time. Yeah, absolutely. And if you can, if you can uh, double your output by getting something off your back, then all of a sudden everyone's looking at HR being like, wow, you guys figured out some new incentive program. We're doing engagement now. How did you guys have time for that? Suddenly you start to look like a hero in the organization. So love the automation. Uh, we've got a couple audience questions and thoughts. So we're going to go ahead and cover those right now. Um, we started to cover some good principles. And now we've got someone asking for specific vendors. So what is the best HRIS that supports setting up new payroll, unemployment, WC accounts in new states, and spinning them down? So 
um, I'll be honest that I don't understand all of all of the requirements there. Um, is there somebody who wants to take a stab at this? It feels like they have a good solution. Go ahead, Christine. I don't mind taking the first stab. Um, and and then to be fair, as a consultant who works with clients to help them uh, find the best vendor for them, whether it's for HR benefits, payroll, time and attendance, whatever, um, I'm not going to call out any specific vendor over any others. I may rattle off a few names, um, but I, I will also say that WC stands for workers' compensation. Um, and it is something that you do have to set up in each state, depending on the state's laws. Um, some states you have to go through the state program. Other states you're allowed to go through a private program. It's part of the wonderful country that we live in that has 50 individual governments <laughs> under a major government. So when, when you're looking for any of the HRIS systems, and there are a lot of them, you have Bamboo, you have SAP, you have Oracle, you have, which used to be PeopleSoft, you now have Workday. Uh, Workday also has payroll, it also has benefits, it also has you know, finances, it also has all these other things to it, but it is an HRIS system, that's how it started. ADP is an HRIS system that's tied to payroll as well. So it really just depends on how, how married you want the data to be. Everyone keeps talking about one platform with all of my information. And if that's your goal, then yes, you are looking at an Oracle, an SAP, a PeopleSoft, a Workday, an ADP, something along those lines. If you're looking for being able to parse it out so that you can change frequently as you grow, then you want to find someone who's specifically focused on payroll, right? So even though Ceridian has Dayforce and it's a gigantic pro uh, platform and it does all of the things from ATS through Cobra, you can you can buy or just use the payroll function. You can use just the tax function. You can use just the benefits section. You can use just the HRIS part of Dayforce, which is fantastic, just as Workday is, just as ADP is. I mean, they've all gone out of their way to make sure that their HRIS parts of their systems are fantastic. And I'm not gonna say it's because it's the easiest, but it's because it's the easiest. <laughs> it's the easiest to put in front of somebody and make it look pretty, right? Then you get into the nitty gritty of how do you take that pretty information and make it work for the client? And that's, that's where it gets a little uglier. So and any of the big names um, are going to be good for helping set up the tax part of things, as long as you are contracting them to set up the tax part of things, which is new payrolls, unemployment and workers' compensation. Those would normally fall under a payroll or a benefits type of situation. Yeah, that was I know that was a very long answer without a whole lot of no, nitty gritty, I, but it it you can't it, that's a hard answer to give yeah. without getting too specific and and giving all the props to one vendor. Right, um, and I I think you probably got that as good as we're gonna get it. If I actually don't <laughs> know who this person is, right off the top of my head, so hop in our Slack group at some point. Maybe we can keep keep the conversation going. I do want to bring in one more question or one more comment. Um, EDI feeds are great, but I've also found that carriers may determine if they support EDI feeds based on the number of employees participating. Um, EDI feeds, can we get a definition on that real quick? Um, yeah, I'll take that. Yeah, go ahead. I'll take that. So an, ED, uh, an EDI feed is just basically an import and export out of the um, HRIS system. So for example, usually the biggest uh, ones that people partner with are their health and wellness. So the Cygnas, the Humanas, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, those types, you know, even Kaiser, if you're in California. So, um, so an EDI feed is just getting all of the information, and it depends on how you set it up. It could be set up on an, a uh, bi-weekly, if you do bi-weekly payroll or monthly or however you set that up, most companies do according to their payroll schedule. And they finish payroll and then they export all of the information out to their appropriate vendors. And so that's what an EDI feed is. And so it's great because if you have people who are hired or terminated, you don't need to go into all the systems and manually input and delete all those people. The EDI feed or the export does that for you yeah. on a biweekly. We do it biweekly. So that's why I'm saying biweekly. Um, but it 
most people do it, like I said, according to their payroll. So, um, but this person is absolutely spot on um, that depending how many lives you have, so not just EEs, but um, their um, dependents, if you have less than a certain amount, they're absolutely correct. They're going to say, wait, this is too much work for that small of a population. So, but it depends on the vendor. Some vendors have a threshold of as low I've seen of 25 and some have 50. So it just depends on who that vendor is. Awesome. Okay. Well, audience members, keep them coming. Um, loving our commentary here, answering as many questions as we can. Um, I want to move into our next section, which is now around proving the ROI. Because like you said, there's so many shiny objects, um, lots of interesting software out there, and it can get expensive. And as Lotus pointed out in the beginning, you do not want to make finance or IT mad. Um, but Lotus, I want to actually maybe have to take a stab at this first and then Sean as well. How do you prove to finance or senior leadership, you know, maybe you picked a software and you're like, yes, this is the one. How do you come back and say, this is the one and this is why it's worth the hundreds or, you know, however many dollars it is a month for us to have this? I think this is where the importance of both the ROI analysis as well as the RFP process come into play. So you want to be selecting strong providers, right, for your RFP process. By the time you actually ask for RFPs, hopefully you've already um, done your research of a bunch of different vendors and you've nailed it down to your whatever, two, three, four, five, however big your organization is. You don't want to have too many going through the RFP process. Um, but that's going to be really important demonstrating to others in the company the value that that software or that technology brings. So usually you're involving other stakeholders outside of HR in those demos and those processes, hopefully, uh, <laughs> so that you're not getting yourself in trouble later. Um, and then the ROI analysis is really important because it's going to be critical to convincing executives, particularly your CFO, so that you can be ready to show what it's going to cost to hire the resources to do what that technology does, mm -hmm. like I mentioned earlier, or what kind of cost savings there will be for the company and what the company can reap by implementing this technology. And it might come down to the cost of compliance or risk or the cost of manual work and labor, or maybe even um, perhaps the cost of a homegrown system. Because sometimes we, you mentioned Google, uh, <laughs> Google yep. Suite, right? like sometimes when we're small, we built these homegrown systems that just are no longer sustainable and they're causing us compliance issues, they're causing us um, errors constantly. So really being able to build that into your cost analysis and your financial analysis is going to be really important. And I find that when you do that work up front, it's a lot easier to get buy-in from the decision maker. Yeah. Um, sounds like a lot of work up front. That's what you need to kind of these big purchases. Um, John, what, what would you add? What, what's kind of uh, your way to prove to leadership that a software is working? Well, I just think the first step would be to just assess what you really need. I mean, if you just need to, let's say uh, you want to get a system for, let's say, benefits. You just need to, you know, convince your manager that this is really what, what we need in order for us to, in order for it to be a little bit more cleaner. In other words, it'll go a little bit faster because you don't want to be stuck in a, in, a, in a mundane type of, you know, type of transaction, you know, that you have to just kind of give so much concentration to. So, Anything that you can do a little easier, then you, you should be able to go to your manager and say, well, I found an easier way, a more cost efficient way, a more time efficient way to do this certain thing. And you just uh, sit down and just talk it out and, and just come to some type of uh, agreement. Yeah. Sounds like time savings can be a big one, a big benefit to present. Um, yeah. Yeah. I want to come back to the process of actually selecting a vendor because I think a few of you, if not all of you at this point, have used the three letters RFP, request, 
for proposal. Um, Sid, maybe maybe you could kind of walk us through this. What is that? Uh, how 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 can somebody new to HR do this process? Um, what does that look like? So what I would recommend is uh, putting the HR functions in buckets, right? Because if you look at the whole elephant, it's, it could be very, very overwhelming. So my recommendation is eat the elephant one bite at a time. So, you know, what's really important? Is it payroll? Is it benefits? Start there. What's most important? And then start typing, like, what do I need this system to do? So like for benefits, I need online enrollment. Um, I need enrollment for new hires. I need it to um, push all of the rates to the payroll system so I don't have to enter it in the payroll system. So I would look at each bucket and ask myself, what do I need the system to do? Or what could be automated? And then it's a lot easier. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, for me, that that's how I would do it. So the RFP process is really writing down what I want to ask the vendor of what their system can do to support me. And, and that's a, a very short answer, but there's yeah. a lot of questions. I'm in the middle of an RFP right now, and I'm at 25 pages. So that might be a little bit much of questions, but that is literally, I'm asking all sorts of stuff. Um, like, do you have employee self-service? What does it entail in employee self-service? Uh, manager self-service. What can managers do or not do? What does your security look like? Um, not only security, but also uh, when Lotus says involve your finance and IT, I wholeheartedly agree with that because I want my IT department to 100% look at the system and make sure that any, uh, and I'm not a tech person, but any security firewall, everything on the back end is secure. So especially if it's going to be on the cloud. Um, from a finance, I want this thing to be able to help me pay people uh, or reimburse them, let's say mileage, but that's non-taxable. So I want that to flow through to NetSuite or um, you know QuickBooks or legal. So I would start asking myself, what can I offload to the system? And that's the questions that I would start adding to the RFP. And then I would send that out to vendors and vendors then reply. Um, in addition, I would also ask, and this goes back to what Christine said in, in, um, in one of the answers a few minutes ago, I want to know what type of company you are. So I want to know what is your, are you privately, I guess I'll start there, are you privately held or publicly held? How many employees do you have? What is your culture? How often do you do updates on your HRIS system? Um, is there a place for feedback from customers? And if so, what is that process? And so um, it, it's a, an RFP uh, is a big, it's a big lift. It's a big lift. Yeah. Well, I mean, with, uh, I mean, you really got to do your due, due diligence. It sounds like uh, with these systems, because like you said, there's a lot out there and the needs can be so complex and varied that you want to make sure it matches well. So it mm -hmm. makes total sense. I think everyone's on the same page now on RFPs and uh, the process there. I uh, have just one more kind of big question. And at the end of these conversations, we always give everyone one last opportunity to, to give kind of some closing thoughts. But um, <clears throat> let's talk about rollout, right? Because you, you pick the software, um, feels like a match made in heaven. Um, you're using it now, or, or you know, it, at some point <clears throat> you're turning it on, you're looking at it, you're starting to go in it. Maybe your employees are as well, uh, but that could be really messy. Maybe you have documents you're transferring from another system, you're bringing them over. Um, I'm bringing up so many questions here, but Christine, what is your advice for post-purchase? How do we make this system now actually work for your employees and for you? A very well-defined and well-executed implementation plan. That is how you ensure success because yeah. thinking about what it's going to look like when it goes live, when it's working, when everybody's putting their information in there, when the applicants are just logging straight in to see what the, you know, what's the status of their application, right? Or 
the onboarding, right? We take the application, turn them into an employee, and now it goes to onboarding. What, what does each of those things look like? If you, if you have an idea as to what you want that to look like, that is how you now set up during implementation your system to accommodate for that at the end. So as you're setting it up, as you're going through A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, you have to make sure that those are accurate, appropriate, compliant, and everything else. Because if you make a mistake here at A through G, by the time you get to Z, you've already got workarounds as part of your base process. And the whole point of going through an implementation is to get rid of any workarounds and have everything in the system streamlined, you know, as automated as possible. So yeah. why go through the RFP? Why go through all of that headache if you're not going to implement it in such a way that it accomplishes the the reason that you bought it for? Yeah. And, and the vendors... So you have to have a, yeah, you have to have a really, really, really good implementation. And if you're doing that outsourced, make sure you're choosing, again, a vendor that understands not only your business, but the vendor that you've selected as your system Make sure that your implementation vendor understands that vendor's system as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. What, what about the employee side? If this is a software, something that the employees are going to be interfacing with pretty regularly, maybe it's a time clock or some, you know, performance management, payroll, pay stub, whatever. Um, what are your what are your advice for kind of rolling it out to them? Is it a training? Is it just a simple email? Is the vendor coming in? I mean, tell me about it. What do you what what kind of advice or tips do you have for that? Uh, I would say if you purchase software from a from a vendor, in regard to employees, yes, I, I would try to make sure I can try to get someone to come in and train my employees because. There's no, there's no such thing actually as a, as a as a bug proof software. You know, you always have problems with software, especially when you first uh, install it, and especially when you first write out your uh, implementation plan. So it just puts everyone at ease if everyone is on a level playing field. Hey, I was so. For example, if we got a new timekeeping system, it's important that everyone knows how to do it correctly and effectively so so we can cut down at least the mistakes to a minimum and we can cut down the implementation to where it'll run a lot more smoothly but i, I do believe in educating employees and, and training employees especially when we get new software awesome we had one uh comment from the audience parallel processes when possible especially payroll we got thumbs up and some nods there. Um, before we move on to just kind of everyone's closing thoughts, we've covered so much already. I just want to I want to make sure, um, Sid or Lotus, if you had anything you wanted to say around implementation or any experiences that you've had or advice you have around implementation, that you have an opportunity to do so if you would like. It might be helpful for people to understand, like when we say implementation, it's a bunch of different phases, right? So you're talking about doing discovery sessions to really understand what the needs are of the stakeholders, doing that stakeholder analysis, pulling in stakeholder feedback sessions, and then going into your scoping sessions, and then doing the build phase, and then testing what you've built, right? You can't just build it and go live. You have to be able to test it and then retest and make corrections before you even go to implementation. And then the other piece that I think um, is really important to call out with implementations is change management. You need that throughout the entire process. That includes your training and that includes your communications. Um, because we have to understand that if you don't communicate the entire time, you can't think communication comes when you're all done building this beautiful system and then you can tell everyone about it and they'll just be really happy. So you have to be talking about this throughout the process involving stakeholders that are going to have to use this system so that you really get that buy-in from them. So there's tons of change management that happens. You're building ambassador programs, right? If you're really doing a big rollout like an HRS system. And then training, like my comment there that I just think is so important. I talk about this all the time at every company is um, training is fantastic and you must do it. Like if you don't do it, like that's just a an easy fail. But 
we have to remember that training is a tiny piece of learning. Learning is a curve. It doesn't happen overnight and through one class, right? And so roll out your training, but make sure that you have a fully thought out learning process so that people can develop their skills over time in whatever it is that you implemented. That means really thinking about ahead of time, how are we going to get people to actually go into the system and utilize it on a regular basis? How do we, because that's going to be repetitive learning when they're actually in the system doing it. So create those opportunities for them to be able to do that. Uh, one small example of how you do that is if you're implementing an HIS, for example, send frequent reminders every year for people to just go in and update their personal information and utilize those self-service features that you've implemented, right? So just getting them reminded to go into the system regularly and just do little activities. Or in an LMS, if you're implementing an LMS, use gamification. Give them badges if they go in and take their mandatory and voluntary learning modules. Just find creative ways to get them in there because that's part of the learning process. Love it. Um, Sid, any, anything else you want to add on implementation? I think the most important, uh, which Lotus took the words right out of my mouth, is change management and buy-in. Um, those are probably the two really big, big, um, I think, things that can have an HRIS system implementation be spectacular or a whopping failure. Um, a great example is I have a, a client who implemented an HRIS system, and when I walked in the building, everyone said, can you get rid of blank? We hate it. And I was like, why do you hate it? And um, it was because there was no change management. There was no buy-in except from one or two people and training was limited. So you have to get those three right to have it be a successful implementation at the end. But implementations are not something that you rush through. Um, and there are many, many different phases. And it should be, uh, again, I'm kind of repeating what Lotus said because it's so important. It should be tested along the way. Yeah. Well, great. Um, if, if everyone's been following along, they now have the software, it's perfectly implemented, and now they're perfectly happy and everything's perfect, right? <laughs> Laid it out really well. Um, seriously, though, thank you for, for taking a really broad and crazy topic and jumping in to uh, so many different aspects of it and sharing your wisdom. But we're going to give you one more chance now. Um, the final question we always ask people is just, you know, in one last sentence or two, what's your last piece of advice for somebody who is looking at HR software solutions right now, trying to upgrade their org in some way or another? Um, so Sean, um, we'll let you have the first uh, thought there. Then we'll go to Christine, Sid, and then we'll close with Lotus. What's your final piece of advice, Sean? Oh, okay. So my final piece of advice would be to really do research about your company and find out what you need. That's the, the main thing. You have to find out what you need and you have to find out what you need to improve. So in most cases, uh, most things do run smoothly, but, you know, it's, it's about the old adage, though, also, time is, is money. So you have to be able to do most things efficiently and effectively. So that's what you have to consider when you're buying a software package is what makes the company, what makes my area, the human resources area, what makes the job flow more effectively and more simplified. Perfect. Christine, over to you. My final piece of advice would be to find a, a partnership instead of a vendor, because when you're partnered with your vendor, you're working with your vendor instead of for your vendor. Awesome. Yeah. Sid? Uh, my final piece would be be purposeful, be methodical, and don't forget to encompass the company needs. Last, last one already, Lotus. Improve your processes and go through a process improvement activity and exercise before you ever implement technology. Technology will never fix a broken process for you. Nice. Yeah. All right. 
great advice from these four uh, throughout the entire last 15 minutes. If you want to learn more about HR software, this video will actually be posted at the top of our HR encyclopedia um, entry on the topic. We actually have specific entries on a lot of the specific softwares they mentioned, uh, change management, some of these other terms that you've heard. And absolutely go out and meet these four. Um, they're all on LinkedIn. They're all awesome. Um, we love any chance we have to get to talk to them. So um, we hope everyone has an amazing rest of their days. And it's been great to uh, get us all online together. So see you guys Thank later. Thank you so much, David. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Stephen. Happy National Payroll Week.